Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 10th lecture of 188. Today, we'll look at reinforcement learning. A couple of quick logistical announcements. Your project two was due last week. The mini contest extends till Sunday. What's in that contest, which is optional? You get to program an AI agent for Pac-Man, a team of Pac-Man, playing another team of Pac-Man. On your own side, you're actually ghosts now, and you can defend your pellets on your side. And then when you go to the other side, you're Pac-Man, you're supposed to eat as many pellets as possible, bring them back to your own camp. Um, if you're carrying pellets and you get caught, you explode into lots of pellets and get reset to your own side. So this is optional. There's a little bit of extra credit associated with it based on beating staff agents. So if you beat the baseline agent, you get a half point. You beat staff agent one, you get a half point. Staff agent two, a half point. Staff agent three, a half point on top of your project two scores. And then in addition, we have a leaderboard, which also has some extra credit, but mostly it's for glory and to show that you have the strongest AI for this Pac-Man game. This runs till Sunday. Um, at this point, there are nine participants in the competition, so a lot of opportunity to land in the top 10 still, um, especially if you're fast. <laughs> um, first team right now is Team No Bug. Is Team No Bug here? Over there, congratulations, it's great. Um, second team right now is Yu Chen Wu. Is Yu Chen here? Congratulations. And third team right now is Run Pac Man Run. It's Run Pac Man Run here. Over there, congratulations. But this is not the final ranking. You're not guaranteed to be third just because you're third right now. You might very well be first come Sunday. Um, there's still a lot of time. Um, I encourage you to try it out. The final contest we'll have will also be a little bit related to this contest where you get to play against each, each other um, on a board where on one side you're Ghost, the other side you're Pac-Man. Any questions about the contest? Project th 3, Reinforcement Learning, will be released very soon, meaning probably tomorrow. Um, it will be on the two lectures from last week on market decision processes and the two lectures from this week on reinforcement learning. And then it'll be due next week, Friday at 4 p.m. Your homework five, which again will have three components, as all homeworks have an electronic, a written, and a self-assessment of the previous written, will go out soon, probably today, maybe tomorrow, and will be due on Monday. Any logistical questions? Okay, let's dive in. Reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, we're going to be studying how to learn behaviors. And this is a long-standing discipline that is studied not just in AI, but also studied in psychology, in cognitive science, and so forth, to try to understand how people and animals learn behaviors. In fact, a good example would be if you had a dog, and it's a little puppy and it doesn't really listen to you yet, and then sometimes you yell at it when you're not happy, and sometimes you give it a treat when you are happy. That's you giving it rewards. And the hope is that somehow, as a consequence of you either yelling or giving treats or saying nice words, um, the dog will somehow become a well-behaved dog. That dog is running reinforcement learning in some sense. It's somehow trying to optimize behavior for rewards, and these rewards, in this case, you are providing them and in that way kind of guiding what the behavior is that you want from the dog, maybe as a function of maybe you call their name or you whistle or something, you want them to do something. That's effectively reinforced learning in action that probably many of you have already seen in real life. Um, what does it mean formally? Uh, there is an agent. The agent gets to choose actions. After they choose an action, the environment will change. There will be a new state of the environment and there will be also a reward associated with what just happened. So reinforcement learning is essentially like mark of decision processes, but it's different in the sense that right now we're not going to know ahead of time 
what the models are for the environment and the rewards. We just get to interact with the world, see what reward we get, interact again, repeat, 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 and hope that over time, from the observed rewards and the observed next states that we experience, we can figure out how to optimize reward. So it's going to be learning rather than direct planning. Okay, so people apply this with robot dogs also. So this is some results I'm going to showcase uh, from Peter Stone's group at the University of Texas, Austin. And there's something called RoboCup. In RoboCup, uh, robots play World Cup soccer among each other. And one of the leagues is the Dog League. This is the Dog League robots. Um, these are Sony Ibo robots, which just came back into production. And now, if you want to do well in soccer, it's actually important to run fast. Um, if you run much slower than your opponent, it's hard to beat them. And so one of the things that they used reinforcement learning for is to train their robot dogs to run as fast as possible. So you can imagine you run reinforcement learning in the lab, and these dogs learn how to run. But then you put them on the actual field, and the field is a little different from your lab field. And they might not do as well, because there's different friction, different properties of the terrain. So what now? Or maybe the dog has played a lot, and a little bit of wear and tear makes it different than how it behaved in the lab. Then what you want to do, and what they did, is they say, well, we have an initial thing. Before we play a game, we can run our lab-trained control policy. It's okay. In the lab, it worked really, really well. But out here on the actual scene of the World Cup for robot dogs, it is kind of slow. Then they say, let's rerun a bunch of trials and run reinforcement learning in the background, and we'll understand better what that means. But this is what it would do before a game starts. It just starts running on that terrain and practicing, understanding how that terrain interacts with its legs. And then after full training, before the game, here's what you get, and you get maximum speed and also very stable head to see what's around you, locomotion. And these dogs beat pretty much every other team all the time. Here's another example of a result attained with reinforcement learning. What we have here is a snake robot. How do you build a snake robot? Essentially, just a bunch of motors uh, sequenced together, and that allows you to build a snake. So if a bunch of motors sequenced together here, the training has already happened. So it's been trained to control itself, to, si to climb on top of the step and sidewind. Let's see how it does. And this was a project in Andrew Ng's lab at Stanford about maybe eight, maybe 10 years ago now, um, a time I was still there. Um, and you see, indeed, the snake is able to get onto that step and actually wants to get to the other side. So once it's on, it'll start sidewinding and make its way over. And you might start seeing a pattern here. And the pattern is that for solving these problems, it's very difficult to build reliable simulators. So far in 188, we've looked at scenarios where we can have a model, either a deterministic or a stochastic model of how the world works, and we could plan in it. But for things like this, how do you build a reliable snake simulator? Very hard to do. Not clear if anybody can do this at this point in time that would match this particular snake. And so if you build a simulator and it's not good, well, then whatever you plan in that simulator might not be a good plan for the real snake, and it might not work in the real world. And so that's why reinforcement when it comes to the rescue here. You can let the thing learn on its own on the task it's supposed to do well at. Here's another example. This is from Russ Tedrick's, lab, uh, Russ Tedrick's PhD thesis uh, at MIT. Um, so what are we looking at here? This is a toddler robot. Um, making a two-legged robot walk is actually pretty tricky. Because if you only have two legs, by default, you're going to fall over. And then once you fall over, it's hard to get up, especially this robot design wouldn't know how to get up once it's fallen over. And also, you might damage the robot. So Russ kind of used some cleverness on both the design side of the robot and the reinforcement learning side. On the design side, if you look at this robot, actually, and hard to see from here, but the feet are curved. And so what it's naturally really good at is going like this. And if you know how to go like this, then you have lifted a leg at any given time, you can swing it forward, take a step, and repeat. And it turns out if you put this robot, I believe it's roughly eight degrees downhill slope, and you start it off to the side so it's wobbling, because of gravity, the downhill slope, it'll swing a leg forward when it's off the ground, 
and it'll actually gradually walk down that 8 degrees or 15 degrees slope that it's designed for. So Russ designed it to passively walk down hills without any control needed if the hill has the right slope. So that means your design is in the right space that it, in principle, should work. If you now kick a little bit of energy into it, maybe it can walk on flat surfaces too. And that's exactly what the reinforcement learning took care of. So initially, when the reinforcement learning starts, it doesn't know how to control the system. And it's just kind of wobbling back and forth. Um, that's what happens when you just randomly put energy into the system. It'll start wobbling left, right. But it gets rewarded for making forward progress. And so over time, it starts figuring out how to make some forward progress. Right now, it's kind of just circling around, not exactly straight line forward progress. But over time, it becomes better and better making this kind of consistent progress. And um, after a good amount of training, it just walks off, it's gone. Um, in your project three, you'll get to do something very similar for this robot here. So this is sometimes the simplest locomotion robot you can imagine. Um, you might wonder, why do we keep it so simple? Why don't we have like a full humanoid robot? Wouldn't that be awesome? Um, the running time for reinforcement learning, the amount of experience it needs to collect to control a full humanoid will be much higher than for a lower dimensional robot. And then it would take maybe a day or so to run your project code. And then if you had a bug and it didn't work, you'd have to go again. And you'd only have a few trials before deadline is hit. Whereas this one, you can run relatively quickly. If it doesn't work right, you can debug it and repeat. So how do you make this thing move? Well, you can control two angles. There is an angle over here and an angle over here. That's where your motors are. You can control those angles. And if you're smart about how you do it, this thing can move. So let's take a look at the video of this in action. Um, this is the robot kind of just, so here, oops, let's see? mute this a little bit. Um, so what are we watching here? The robot is just randomly moving its arm around. And sometimes that means it moves forward. Sometimes it means it moves backward. But we give it reward, negative for moving backwards, positive for moving forward. And the hope is that reinforcement learning, based on that signal, can figure out what is a good um, policy to control the robot. Now, this takes a while. So in this video that we recorded here, we'll skip forward uh, a lot of attempts. So we're not watching all the learning in action. Um, you might wonder, why is this hard? Why isn't it easy to just pedal yourself forward? Well, it has a lot of options in terms of what to do. And it doesn't know ahead of time how it works and has to figure it out from its own experience. And in fact, when you reach forward, you don't move. It's only once you put your pickle down and start pulling, you move forward. So first, you need to go through a phase where nothing happens for you. You don't get rewarded. And so it's hard to learn to do that because you don't get any signal that's the right thing to do. That's like giving your dog no feedback for a whole day, let's say, and then at the end of the day, say, good dog, that was a great day today, or bad dog. It's not going to learn. The more your reward is spaced out over time, the harder to learn. And so what makes this hard is that you do need that period of getting no reward and somehow discover that that's the way to achieve reward in the long run. So if you successfully uh, complete your project three, you will have implemented a reinforcement learning algorithm that learns to control the crawler bot. OK, let's formalize a little bit what we're thinking about today. Reinforcement learning. We'll still assume that we're working with a market decision process, which we've looked at for the past two lectures already. As a reminder, what does that mean? There's a set of states, the configurations the world can be in. There's a set of actions available to the agent to take. And then there's a model. And this model is a probabilistic model that says, what is the probability of landing in state S prime if you start in state S and took action A? And then there's a reward function that says, how good was that transition that you just experienced? And that's what we want to optimize. So we'll still be looking to optimize behavior in an MDP. But the twist is that we now don't know T or R. So remember, previous two lectures, you would see things like value iteration, policy iteration. If you look at those equations, what appears in there is T and R. And because you have T and R, you can run through those equations and get a value function and a policy that might be good. But now, in this lecture and next lecture, we're not going to know T or R, yet still want to solve this problem. So the problem is the same, but what we have available in terms of information about the problem has changed. What that means in practice is that you need to try things. Because as an agent, you don't know how the world functions. You need to experiment. And so reinforcement learning engine is an agent that experiments in the world, from that figures out how the world works, where the rewards are, how does it dynamically evolve, and then from there, 
is able to hopefully achieve high rewards. So if we look at this picture here from last time, now the picture would become like this. We don't have access anymore to how the world works or where the rewards are unless we experiment and experience them. So offline would be value iteration, policy iteration, which we can do when we have the full MDP model available. There our agent would, when it's supposed to navigate a maze, would think about the consequence of its actions, say, well, if I did this, then that, if I did this, then that, let me do this thing because that gives me high reward. In RL, the agent has to go try it out. This can be pretty painful at times, um, so often people prefer to do RL in simulation when possible because in real world, if you need to experience things, often there's a high cost associated with experiencing the negative rewards. Um, but this is what effectively needs to happen. Okay, and actually one thing to remark here is that in print, this agent, when it's not falling in a fire pit yet, it doesn't know that a fire pit is bad. Um, and so in reinforced learning, you only know something is bad once you've experienced it, and that's why you'll experience some of these things before you know what is the right thing to do. Okay. There's a few ways of incarnating reinforcement learning. There's model-based learning and there's model-free learning. We'll start with the model-based and then we'll transition to model-free, but both are totally good approaches. Not one is better than the other. Um, one is a little simpler than the other, which is model-based to understand what's going on, so we'll do that one first. So what's a model-based idea? You learn an approximate model based on experiences, okay? So you, you act in the world, you see how the world works, you have an estimate of how the world works, and based on that, you build a model. Then, once you have that model, you just solve against that model. You can use the techniques from last week to solve against that model. So step one would be something like you're acting, 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 and you just, uh, if it's a discrete world, you keep track of counts. How often, when I was in state S, took action A, did I land in state S prime? How often did I land in S double prime? How often in S triple prime? And then you can, from those statistics, build a model, say, well, it looks like one-third of the time I land in this state, two-thirds of the time in that state, and zero in other states. That might be your model for that particular starting state and that action, and you'd have that for every starting state and every action that you're willing to consider. Same for the reward. You could keep track of, for each transition, what reward did you get, and then, in this case, let's say, build a table of what reward is about to happen for a specific triple. Once you've done that, then you can solve the learned MDP. Learned is important here, so it won't be the true MDP most likely, because if you have to estimate how the world works from experience, usually you're not super precise. It's going to be approximate, but you're going to solve this approximation of the real world by, let's say, running value iteration. That gives you a policy. You can use the policy and act. Okay, let's look at an example. So initially, we don't know nothing about the world. Now, on slides, it's a little hard to signal we know nothing about the world. So um, bear with me for a moment here, but even though we can see that this is a world with five, five states and that there's some kind of pattern of how you can transition and that you probably can't go from B to D or from E to D, those things are actually not available to the agent when the agent starts out. The agent will just know, I'm in a state right now. I have some actions to choose from. Let me see what happens. So maybe after four episodes in this world, this is what has happened to the agent. Uh, and maybe this is the strategy they used for uh, acting. From B, go east. From C, go east. And from E, go north. And from A and D, you can only exit. So no options available than just that one option. OK, so we've done that. We collected experience. Next step in model-based reinforcement learning is to now turn that experience into a model, an MDP, market decision process, that models the world based on this experience. What would that mean? Well, we can look at when we do east in B, um, that happened twice, we always landed in C. So our model would be transition, B, east, C, probability of landing in C from B after taking action east is one, if we just look at the frequencies here. In this middle one-third of 188, we'll look a lot at probabilities and how you might want to maybe estimate this slightly differently and not be so deterministic from a small amount of data. But for now, let's just use the frequencies that are present as our estimates of the probabilities. So we saw it was always C, so we set the probability equal to 1. How about when we go 
um, from C go east, uh, what happens? It looks like three out of four times we end up in D, and one out of four times we end up in A. So we'd have T, C, east, D happens sometimes, and T, C, east, A happens. And this happens three out of four, and this happens one out of four. Okay, so that's, the, that's what we can do to build a model for rewards. We can also read them off, uh, spelled out on the slides in typeset font rather than hand scribbled. Um, this is what we get. Once we have the model, we can run value iteration or policy iteration, whichever you prefer, and get out a policy that will be, in some sense, as good as this model captures how well the, the, how the real world works. Any questions about how model-based RL works? Because that's it for model-based RL. It's, yeah. It's a good question. So the question is, what is known and what is not known? Um, I've made very clear T and R are unknown ahead of time. Whether you know the state space and the action space, um, that's more debatable whether you consider that given or not. Um, in principle, it doesn't matter too much in this setting because if you don't know the state space, I mean, you still know the current state and you'll only um, build models probably around states you've experienced rather than some external states. But Different people will consider that differently when they say model-based RL. Um, for one idea, you can assume that the, the states are, the state space is a given, action space is a given. We just don't know T and R. Yes? Do you ever update the policy? Okay, good question. So model-based learning. So, um, in model-based learning, you first collect data, build a model. Once you have your model, you find uh, a value function, v star, against this model. It will not be the real v star, it will be against this particular model that you just learned. After you have that, often you go back. You might execute that policy or a variation of that policy to see how well it actually works in the real world. Collect more data. Impu improve your dynamics model with the new data and repeat. And so you'd go around in a cycle through this. This step of collecting more data is something we'll see more about in next lecture. What's important there is a the notion of exploration. You need to try things you haven't tried before. So kind of two things will happen at the same time. Because you have learned a policy, or, or validation has given you a policy against the learned model, you can go check how well that actually works compared to in your simulator. If it works equally well, then probably your simulator was good and you might be all set. If it doesn't work as well, then you, that, means, as it, that means that you're getting new data that can inform you about how the world works differently from or, what your simulator thought. And so you learn something new. So there's some notion of either it works just as well or you learn something new. You learn something new, improve your model, and repeat. Now, to learn something new more quickly, you often don't want to just directly execute this policy, but you might want to do something called exploration and more about that next lecture. Yes? In order for model-based learning to work well, we need to have a, a uniform spread of the samples across the different states. That, that's a question about exploration. Let's revisit that um, once we're covering exploration. Yes? So the question here is, where, where does the reward function come from? That's your question, effectively, right? Um, so it varies. So for most AI agents, the reward function would come from a human designer who decides what they want. Now, there's a lot of tricky issues with that. You need to design it correctly. If you're naive about how you design it, things won't work very well. Like, let's say you have a vacuum cleaner robot, you say, oh, just any time you pick up dirt, you get positive reward. Then it might start emptying trash cans so it can pick up a lot of dirt. And that's actually the optimal way against what you then specify, but it's not what you intended. So definitely there's a lot of challenges in specifying it, but specifying the reward is also our control over the agent. It's how we tell the agent what we want. Um, but there is a good body of research that specifically is about how do we go about specifying this in a clever way. 
Um, because if we don't, then this thing will just optimize against whatever we asked for, and what we asked for might just not really be what we really wanted. Yes? So for this setting here, the way we calculated T was by just looking at the frequencies. So the reason we got one here is because in the four episodes we looked at, whenever we were in state B and took action east, every time we landed in C, so that's why we gave it probability one. It's just one procedure. It's a relatively simple one that we're using for now. Um, then we were in C and took the action east. Three times we ended up in D and one time in A. So the 0.75, three out of four, is the empirical uh, estimate of how often you end up in D, and the 0.25 is the empirical estimate of how often you end up in A. As I said, um, the middle one-third of the class will go into a lot of depth about estimating probabilities and reasoning with probability distributions, and you'll then see ideas that might, might make you want to do this a little differently, but for now, let's just assume we use the frequencies we observe and are happy with it. Okay, that's model-based RL. That wasn't too hard, I hope. Um, now, to contrast model-based RL with model-free RL, we'll look at an example of model-based estimation versus model-free estimation in an extremely simple setting. So it's not going to be a reinforced learning setting. It's going to be really, really simple, but just to highlight the difference. And then from there, we'll go to the more complicated setting again. Okay, let's say we want to compute the expected age of CS188 students. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means we need, for every, we need to somehow have a distribution over ages and take a weighted sum for each age, multiply with probability of that age, and that gives us the expected value of age in 188. Okay, we've seen that before. That's how you compute expected values. What if we don't have this probability distribution? That's kind of the simplified counterpart of not having the model T in the MDP slash reinforced planning setting. What if we don't have this P? Well, what can we do? Um, we can then go collect samples, ask a bunch of students, what's your age, what's your age, what's your age? Um, after we've done that, we could then build a model of this probability distribution. We could say, well, um, we say, how often was a certain age mentioned? Let's say, how often did somebody say 20? Divided by the total number of samples we collected, and that's our estimate of the probability of 20 years old. Once we have those estimates, that's our model that we learned, we can use it to estimate the expectation using the exact same equation, but this little hat here denotes that this is an estimate of the probability. We don't know the true probability, but this is our estimate. So this is a way that we can compute what we wanted, um, even though we didn't initially have access to a model, but then we have an estimate of the model. There's another way you can do this, and you probably would have done this a different way, actually. Probably what you would have done, instead of building this model and then computing an expectation, you would have just taken a bunch of measurements and averaged them because the expected value is the average. Um, so why does this work? Let's look at these two equations here. We have this equation here, this equation here. What's different about them? Well, a very s striking difference is that on the left, there is a weighting by the probability, and on the right, there is not. How come? How come on the left we have to weight by the probability, and on the right we don't? Well, it's because on the right, we drew samples, randomly picked people from the class, and asked them what their age is. And the way these samples work is that they already obey the distribution. If there's a lot of people of age 20 in our samples, there will be a lot of samples with age 20. And so the probabilities are reflected in how, how often a certain age appears in this, running, this average that we compute over n samples here. And so they compute the same thing actually here, but in a different way. Any questions about this? Because this is going to be fundamental to understanding model-free RL. Yes? Sorry, say it again. Oh, what is the I? So I here is indexing over students. And so we have, a, we have let's say, 800 students, but capital N might only be, let's say, 50, because we're only going to sample 50. And then capital I is indexing from 1 through 50. We randomly pick a student um, each time and then average their age. Here, A is indexing over age. Correct. So you would go, I mean, I don't know, maybe 
not from zero, but from some reasonable age, it would be probability non-zero probably, and uh, average it out. Okay, yeah? Okay, so yeah, that's really the fundamental thing we, we need to understand to go from model based to model free. So the question was, how come it's here, but we don't have a PAI appearing over here? We don't have this. Why not? Intuitively, the reason we don't is because the way these things appear here, the AIs, it, the I corresponds to a random student. So randomly pick a student in the room, ask, what's your age? The p randomly pick another student, ask their age. And so if there's a high probability of, let's say, age 20, then a lot of these randomly picked students will say 20. And so 20 will appear many times in this summation here. Whereas if, let's say, age 15 is unlikely and rarely appears, then when I randomly sample people and ask their age, it might only appear once out of 800 or something. And so automatically it's downweighted because it doesn't show up much in the samples. If you were to add this probability here, nevertheless, you'd be somehow double counting the probabilities. And that's not good. You don't want to double count them. You want to count them exactly the right amount. And here, the counting happens through the sampling process rather than through explicitly multiplying with the probabilities. Um, is it a strong assumption to make? Um, the assumption we make here, well, a couple of things. I'm not claiming this is, I mean, there's an approximation here. If you don't sample everyone, it's not going to be super precise. Then if you wonder about these two, actually they compute the exact same thing. Like if you, if you take, collect a set of samples, A1 through AN from N students, and either you go this round or this round, you'll end up with the same number. It's a different way of computing what ends up being the same number. So it's not that on one side you make a bigger assumption than on the other side. Okay. So let's then transition, transition to model-free, not age estimation in 188, but model-free reinforcement learning. We'll do this in two phases. We'll look at passive reinforcement learning and active reinforcement learning. Passive will mean that we just are trying to estimate quantities we care about, let's say values, but we don't worry about acting in the world. We somehow just watch things in action and try to estimate the values of states for this agent. In active reinforcement learning, we also worry about how do we collect the data to estimate these values from. So let's start with passive, because then we don't have to worry about taking actions. We'll just observe them. Okay. Then, since we don't get to choose actions, we somehow observe a policy in action. So there'll be some fixed policy, which we get to observe in action. We don't know the transitions. We don't know the reward. But we see sequence of state, action, state, reward associated with the transition, then again action, again state, and the reward associated with the transition over and over and over, coming from this policy pi of s. The learner here is just along for the ride, watching this in action. Um, you don't get to choose what actions are taken. The policy is just executed as is, and you try to evaluate quality of the policy. What does it mean? Quality of the policy is the value it achieves. Right? Value is expected reward you get over time, and high value is good, means high expected reward. And so we want to evaluate for a policy. How good is this policy? OK, so the goal, computing values for each state under policy pi. In direct evaluation, so we have passive versus active, well, we have model-based versus model-free. Then under model-free, we have passive and active. We're in the model-free passive now. Under model-free passive, there will be direct and indirect. We're doing direct now. So we're slightly deep in, um, but that's the simplest thing to start from for model-free. So direct evaluation means that we just average the observed sample values. So we observe agent acting according to pi, and every time you visit a state, you just say, okay, how much reward did I get from then onwards? And that gives you a sample measurement of how good that state is under your current policy. And then you average uh, over many experiences. So let's do this for a small example. 
Here is the input policy. Then, again, a bunch of episodes get observed. And now we can ask the question, what are the values of each of the states? Not based on knowing exactly how this MDP works, but based on only having observed this here. OK, well, I th let's think about this. And let's try to draw this into this grid. There's five states. What are the values of the states? Well, let's see. For A, where did we visit A? We visited A only over here. And then what happened is we got negative 10. So A, we've only experienced once. And the result was negative 10, episode over. So the, our estimate of the value for A is negative 10. Also happens to be the exact value in this case. But this is also our estimate based on this experience. How about uh, another simple one, D? D we experienced three times. And every time we experienced D, we got a plus 10. So we average the three plus 10s together. That gives you plus 10. How about um, B? We've been in B here and here. When we were in B, we got a negative 1, a negative 1, and a 10. So this is plus 8. When we're in B here, we got negative 1, negative 1, 10. That's plus 8. Um, we assume our discount factor gamma is 1 to keep the calculus uh, simple. So there's the only two times we saw B. The average of 8 and 8 is 8. So the value for B is 8. OK, let's take a look at C. We experience C over here, over here, over here, over here. Here we got negative 1 and 10. That's 9. Here we got negative 1 and 10. That's 9. Here we got negative 1 and negative 10. That's negative 11. Here we got negative 1 and 10. That's 9. So we have three 9s and one 11. We average that. So we sum it all together. Divide by 4. Let's see. 27 minus 11, 16. Divide by 4. That is plus 4. So this is the first kind of more interesting one where we had different types of experiences. We average what we got from them, and that's our estimate. How about E? E we experience here and here. Here we end up with negative 1, negative 1, 10. That's 8. And here we have negative 1, negative 1, 10. That's also 8. So for E, we'll also have 8. Is that right? No, that's a negative 10 here. This is bad. Negative 12 rather than 8. So we have an 8 for E over here and a negative 12 here. The average of that is negative 2. That's what direct evaluation does for us. That's the procedure, fairly simple. OK, so what's good about this? It's very simple. You just look at, for every state, whenever you were there, what happened afterwards, compute the discounted sum of rewards, and average it, and that's your estimate. You don't need to do anything with T and R. Um, you just average these uh, sum of rewards. What's not so good about it? It actually wastes a lot of information about how the world works. Because it never really considers correlations between states. Look at this here. I mean, this is a crazy way to assign values. Because when you're in E, you always go through C. When you're in B, you go through C. But somehow, you say, for B, my value is plus 8. And for E, my value is negative 2. But really, they should be the same. Because when we go from B or E into C, that's the only thing we've done from there, um, we get negative 1 for the transition. And then after that, we're in C. And we should get whatever C is worth not something different depending on where we came from. So the consistency is lost here between consecutive states. Um, and then even between these two states, how is it possible that from E you expect negative 2, but from C you expect plus 4? That's not compatible. I mean, that must remind you a little bit of like inconsistent heuristics in one of the early lectures. You can't say oh, it's going to be negative 2 from E, and all of a sudden it's actually going to be plus 4 now from, from C. That's not compatible. But that's just what it gives us, because we don't look at a lot of detail of what's in the data. Um, we just look at summaries. How much did you get from each state and average it? And so that's why this is not super precise. But if you keep collecting data, and you collect data infinitely long, it'll average out to the right thing. You just need to collect more data than we collected in this case. And once you have infinite data, all of this will work out nicely. But often in learning, it's not about what you learn after infinite data. You want to learn more quickly than after infinite time. So what else can we do? Um, maybe we can do something closer to policy evaluation. Um, we saw policy evaluation last lecture. Um, 
What did it mean? Well, you were in a state, and then your policy chooses an action, and then um, you might be in some kind of queue state where you are committed to an action for that state, and then from there you randomly transition into what the next state is going to be. And with this diagram, there was a set of backup equations called Bellman equations that told you how to do dynamic programming to efficiently find values of states. The way it was done was, well, if you have zero time steps left, so notation, the bottom index means how many time steps left. Zero time steps left. Top is the policy you use, policy pi. Then S is the state you're in. If you have zero time steps left from state S using policy pi, you'll get reward zero because there's nothing left to do for you. Then there's a recursion that says the value when you have k plus one steps left in your agent's life can be computed as a function of what happens in the first step of that agent's life, which is some action gets chosen, and then there's some distribution over possible next states based on that action. That's this transition here. Um, and then there is reward associated with that transition. And then there is the rest of the agent's life, which at this point is k long, because you start with k plus 1, where you took one step in your life, you have k steps left. And assuming we know the value with k steps left, then we can use that to compute this way the value for k plus 1 steps left. If we use an equation like this, we are definitely using the connections between the states and exploiting that if states are next to each other and one comes after the other, their values will be very related thanks to this equation. But how to do this? Because we don't have T and R. So what we're going to answer in the remainder of this lecture is all centered around this question, how do you solve a Bellman equation like this one, and we'll also see the value iteration equation later, without having access to T or R? Well, let's give it a shot. This is the equation we want to work with. Um, so what we want is essentially somehow start in state S, use our policy a few times from there, see what happens, and then that gives us sample experiences, and then we want to average that. Because we don't have the model, but we can act in the world to see what happens, see where we land, see how much reward is associated with it, and let's for now assume we have the small k time steps left value function, because we'll start at v0 anyway, right? And v0, we have that 0, that's easy. And so we can then get v1, if we can make this work, then v2, and so forth. So this is a way to compute this quantity over here by averaging experience in the real world rather than computing an expectation with the probabilities in there. Remember the age averaging? The age averaging on the left on the slide, model-based, use the probabilities explicitly, the age averaging equation on the right would be corresponding to averaging these sample values. Okay, we average them, we get a value for k plus one steps to go. Um, what's the tricky part here? Well, the tricky part here is that typically you cannot just put your agent anywhere and now say, okay, let's go there, let's act from there, and then let's reset you, let's go again, because the agent is acting in some kind of environment, and the dynamics of the environment might not allow you to reset it every time to wherever you want it to be. So we might not be able to actually collect this data the way it's described here. So in practice, we might need a little different than what we do here. But if we could collect the data from a specific state multiple times, this is what we could do. And we could effectively run policy evaluation with an averaging version from samples rather than a weighted expectation using the equation up there. OK, we can't rewind time unless we have some kind of helpful daemon for us. Um, so what can we do? if we don't have this daemon? Well, the main idea is that we want to learn from every experience that happens. So any time we get an experience, which is state, action, next state, reward, we want to learn something from it that ties into this Bellman equation. How can we do this? Um, OK, let's think about this. Our policy will still be fixed, so we're still doing evaluation but the values will hopefully become more and more precise about what the value of each state is under that policy. So let's say we get an experience. What it means is we get a sample of the value of the policy in state S expressed as immediate reward plus gamma times future expected reward from the next state onwards. That's our sample, just like we had samples here, same type of samples, but now we consider only one instead of having many. Now, how do you average one? in a meaningful way, um, well, maybe this is what we can do. We can say we assume we already have some running average 
And maybe we initialize it to zero, um, but we assume we already have a running average. And then what we say is we have a running average, v pi of s, and we're going to bootstrap of that. We're going to keep that mostly. So alpha will be, let's say, maybe 0 0.9. Uh, let's see. We, keep, we want to mostly keep what we already have. So let's say 0 0.1. Let's say alpha, to make it concrete, equals 0 0.1. That means 0 0.9 times what we already have. And this will not be precise. This is just something we hope that might be somewhat precise. And we correct it with the sample value. This is not a normal way of computing an average. It's a running average calculation. But what it allows us to do is, as new experiences come in, go look at our table. What is our current value estimate for this state? And add on the current experience to improve that estimate. Another way to write is as follows. We keep the current estimate, but add a alpha-sized or scaled correction to it based on the difference between the current experience, which is noisy, because one experience doesn't tell you the whole story, so it's a noisy estimate, the current experience and what we have as our best estimate so far, look at the difference and add it on times a small scaling factor. Let's look a little bit at this running average. What does it mean to compute such a running average? OK, well, what it really means is that somehow let's abstract it for just something that's not necessarily values. We have some x. Um, we get an x1, an x2, an x3, and so forth. and want to compute the average of all the x's. And the running average is this x bar thing. After we've seen n minus 1 samples, x bar n minus 1 is the running average. Then we see an n sample, and we're going to correct the running average by adding on the n sample by taking an average between the new sample and our running average that we have so far. It makes recent samples more important. It's not the same as computing the actual average. It's a little different. Um, so here's what it'll do if you expand this. This is the kind of weighting you get. And remember, 1 minus alpha ends up being a number between 0 and 1. So the higher the exponent, the smaller this becomes. And so this is the biggest contributor. This is the second biggest contributor, third biggest contributor, and so forth. So it's kind of a skewed average where later experiences count for more than earlier experiences. You might think of it as a, as a bug. Don't I want like the real average? But soon enough, you'll see why this is actually even better. It's better to skew towards the later ones. OK, so you forget about the past. And kind of intuitively, what's happening is that when I showed you this equation here, this is the previous slide, I said, let's assume we already have some estimate, right? And we're going to average with it, and we're also going to use it here. So that estimate initially is not correct, and we're just using it. But after we do an update, it becomes more correct. And so the further we are in this process, the more precise these vpis are, and so the more precise are these sample values that we calculate here that we average in. And so that's why the later ones are good when they're weighted more highly than the early ones, which are pretty random. If you make your alpha go down to zero with the appropriate scheme, don't worry too much about the specifics here for now, but you make it go to zero, then this will converge in the limit. OK, let's look at this in action. Same uh, environment we have now. We're going to learn from every experience on the fly. So we start in state B. We have some current estimates of our values, um, and we're going to try to improve them from our experience. First thing we do is we move east, land in C, get a reward of negative 2. What does that mean? That means we experienced a sample value of what is the sample value? Sample value will be reward, which is negative 2, plus gamma, which is 1 in this case, times the value of the next state, which is C. So let me write this as reward we experienced plus gamma times value. Reward is negative 2. Gamma is 1. And the value of the next state, C, that we have as our estimate right now is 0. So our sample value is negative 2. Now we can do an update to our value for b. v pi of b becomes 1 minus alpha v pi of b that we had before, plus alpha times the sample value, which is negative 2. Alpha is a half. Our previous v pi of b is 0. So the result will be here that this becomes 
negative 1. So after one experience, we've updated our value estimates, and this became negative 1. The other ones didn't change. The only one that changed is the state you left, because the state you left is the one for which you get a new estimate of the value of that state. Other states you didn't get any new information about. Then we can repeat this process. Now we take, again, action east, land in D, reward of negative 2 associated with that. We can go through the same process. Um, reward plus gamma times V of next state, which is D, is our sample value up here. Um, reward negative 2 plus gamma, which is 1, times value of D, which is 8. So this is equal to 6. So our sample value will be... Let's make this for... C now, we experienced an exit from C. Um, we're going to update the value for C by adjusting it towards the sample value of 6. Learning rate is a half, so what this happens to be in C so far it was 0, so we have 0. Oops. We have, well, to make it explicit, 1 minus 1 half times 0 plus 1 half times 6, which is 3. So our new value for C Estimate for C's value is going to be 3, and none of the other values changed because we didn't learn anything new about the other states. Actually, let's take a break here, and then we'll start looking at some of the remaining issues we need to resolve to get this working uh, more fully. All right, let's uh, restart. Any questions about anything we covered so far? Yes. Okay, yeah, that, that's a really good observation, and it's worth emphasizing. Um, so the question was, 
why did the value of C go up even though you got a negative reward when exiting C to go into D? And the reason is that when we compute values, we want to estimate the total expected discounted sum of rewards over all future times left in the life of the agent. And so it's exactly what you're pointing at. There is still time left in the life of the agent. They're in D, then onwards. And from D, they're going to, based on our estimate, get 8. And so even though there was a negative 2 associated with the transition itself, there is a plus 8 associated with the estimate of everything that's going to be accumulated over future times. And that's captured by this term over here. So the reward, instantaneous reward, is this term. And then all future times are summarized in that term. And that's the 8 discounted. In this case, discount factor is 1. So it doesn't really get discounted. And that's how we get to minus 2 plus 8, 6, as the new estimate based on the current sample. Then the old estimate was 0. Our learning rate alpha is 1 half. So that means we average half of what we had and half of the new thing. So half of 0 plus half of 6 makes for 3. OK, so what we can do now is we can have an agent act in an environment. We can decide to never build a model of how the world works. We never build a T. We never build an R. Yet we can recover V values, the values of the policy for each state. And it turns out if you run this long enough and the learning rate goes down over time, you get accurate values for each of your states. Now. Last uh, week, you saw an algorithm called policy iteration. And one of the two components in policy iteration was policy evaluation. Once you know how to evaluate your policy, then you still need to do something else, which is improve your policy, um, which was the policy update step. Now, to improve your policy, actually, you need to somehow have access to a model, because you somehow are looking at reward and next state value, but then you need this model to see which action actually maximizes that. And so we're still kind of stuck with what we've seen so far because we don't have the model. So we don't know how to update our policy. So we know how to get values for our policy for each state, just know how to update it. Now, the key idea for the remainder of this lecture is that maybe we've been doing it all wrong in some sense. Um, because if just instead of learning the values of the regular states, the V states, why don't we learn the values of the Q states? Because if we learn the values of the Q states, then this is all very easy. Once you have the Q values, for every state, you have the value of state S and taking action A in state S, followed by whatever you do after. Then you can now see which action achieves the highest Q value, and that would be the one you want to take. So maybe we just need to swap it around, start learning Q values. You might wonder, why didn't we just like from the beginning learn Q values? Um, just the math is a little simpler, learning V values and, and some other kind of methods, it actually is quite relevant to learn V values. Um, but now we'll switch to learning Q values, because that'll give us the extra power to be able to improve our policy as we learn the values. And so what we can then do is we can, as we update our Q values, we actually also, if we want to, update how we act in the world and repeat and become better and better and better over time. OK. So um, this now will be active reinforcement learning, because now when we learn Q values, the Q values can prescribe to us what we want to do. And we can actively collect our data while learning the Q values. Now, how do we learn the Q values? It'll be very similar to how we learn the V values. We need to do a little bit of trickery still. Um, we still don't know the transitions, still don't know the rewards, but we get to choose the actions. And we'll do it based on our Q values that we have so far, which will be approximate, but might give us some guidance in terms of what's promising, what's not promising. But the goal is that ultimately we end up with the optimal Q values that tell us this is the optimal action to take and we'll give you this much value. So the learner now makes choices. There will be a fundamental trade-off. And we're not going to go into that this current lecture, but we'll see a lot of that in the next lecture. Because it turns out you don't necessarily always want to follow based on what you've learned so far. Sometimes you want to fundamentally just try something new you never tried before. Because that might accelerate your learning rather than just keeping doing what already looked good in the past. That's the exploration exploitation trade-off. Uh, more in the next lecture. But keep this in mind, because it's an important concept that I want you to be aware of from the beginning. OK.
Keep in mind also, Q-learning is not some kind of offline planning. We're not building a model and planning in it. We're actually acting, collecting data, improving our Q-values, just like we did with V-values, but we haven't seen the math yet for the Q-values. OK, so in value iteration, we start with V0 for each state is equal to 0. And that's intuitively meaningful, because when there's 0 time left, you'll get 0 reward for the remainder of your life as an agent. And from there, you can recurse to compute values for more and more time steps left. From V0, you can get V1. From V1, you can get V2, and so forth. Can we rewrite this in terms of Q values? Because if we can, then we can maybe do the same thing as we did with V values and learn them from experience rather than learning them from, rather than computing them from having a model. OK, well, Q0, with zero time steps left, we can also set equal to zero. That's correct. Nothing different there. How about QK? Can we compute it from a Q with less time steps left? OK, well, here's what we can do. If we have QK plus 1, and let's step through this in detail, um, QK plus 1 is the value for being in state S, taking action A, and then keep going from then onwards and to compute how much value you're going to collect um, from S onwards for K plus 1 time steps. You can decompose that into what happens in the first step and what happens in the remainder K. The first step, it is whatever reward you get. And remainder K, well, the recursion tells you that you already computed it for the smaller K. You can just plug that in. What value do you get from state S prime? Well. It's the max over all actions available to you of QKS prime A prime. This is the recursion we want to work with, and then this is all weighted by the probability of landing in a state S prime. These are essentially the same, but just kind of reorganized a bit to be written in terms of Q values rather than V values. But it's the same dynamic programming principle that the value for K plus one time steps left is what you get in the first step, plus what you get in the remainder k steps. And we assume we already know the values for k steps left, and so we can bootstrap off of that to get the ones for k plus 1. Now, if we look at this equation, the difference between the two, the difference is that this one starts with a max, and this one starts with a averaging. The one that starts with a max, we cannot just have samples and, and make it work. Because a max, based on samples, that, that doesn't work out. The samples are happening behind the max. It's not clear how to do this. Nobody's figured this out. But here we have the sampling up front. If we have a sampling up front, an expectation being computed, we can do that based on just samples we draw. Without having access to a model, we can just average the actual samples we experience. So what we've seen so far, to contextualize it, we've seen policy evaluation. That's what we've seen so far. And there we have an average up front, too. Then we have value iteration, which is this one here. But because of the max up front, we can't do the sample-based estimation. So we're stuck. But by reorganizing it in terms of Qs, we have samples up front again. And this is a Q value iteration, which also, if you iterate this, computes the optimal values just in a slightly different iteration scheme. But the beauty is that we can use this iteration scheme to start taking averages rather than using the model itself. OK, so we have Q-value iteration. We're going to make it sample-based. What does that mean? Well, as we get a new experience, let's say in some kind of grid world, I'll show some examples soon, um, you receive a sample S, A, S prime, R. You have a current old estimate of your Q-value for S and A. You're going to update it. You're going to say, I have my sample right now, which tells me, hmm, I got this much reward, plus in the future I expect to get this amount, which is one of these terms. It's only one of these terms. So it's not an accurate estimate. It's not the precise Q value. It's just one of the terms. But we can use it in our running average to update our current estimate. And as we update often enough on, from enough new experience, we will get the correct average in here. Assuming, again, alpha goes down so we don't keep like uh, hopping around. Let's look at some demos of this in action. 
So here. So what are we looking at here? This is a standard grid world. We know how this works, um, but we're going to watch what happens when Q-learning is taking an experience and trying to learn the values for each of the state action pairs. So each state now has four values when there is four actions. So most of these states have four actions, so there's four values. There's two exit states, which only have one action, so they only have one value. We initialize everything equal to zero. Now I'm going to do a first experience, moving up. What do you think is going to happen to the Q values? Well, we need to know about rewards, of course. Here the rewards are zero unless you take these exits. So if you move up, nothing's going to happen. All values stay the same because your previous estimate was zero for the Q value of the bottom left state for going up. You experience zero reward plus gamma times max overall Q values in the new state, but that max overall Q values is also zero. So the sample value is zero. The old value was zero. Nothing changes. When we move up again, what's going to happen? Same thing. There will be zero reward, and the max overall the values there is zero. So the sample value will be zero. Averaging the sample value of zero with the existing value of zero will remain zero. Same moving to the right. Same moving to the right. How about here? Still the same thing, because the value of the next state is zero. But now, when we take the exit action, a non-zero sample will come in. A reward of, uh, in this case, I believe one was received plus one. The learning rate is a half, so we had zero before. Reward of one, and then it finishes, so no future value. So the sample value is one. Average the one with the zero gives us a half. Now we go again, same way. Everything stays zero here because the sample values are all zero. But now from this state here, if we go right, we will experience a sample value that's non-zero. Why? Not because the reward is non-zero. Reward is still zero, but the sample value is reward plus sample value is reward plus max of Q values in the next state. Max of Q values in the next state is 0.5, and we'll average the 0.5 with the zero that we have, making it 0.25. And the last one averages at 0.5 with one to get to 0.75. Now we have a 0.12. Now as we keep Running that same trajectory, we see that the values propagate from that termination state all the way to the start state gradually through averaging of values from future states. Okay, let's do this a few more times. Oh, let's go back here. Oh, what happened here? So I went right, I came back, and I got 0.13 at the bottom. Why do we get 0.13 here? I've never from this state experienced a reward, but you don't need to. From this state, we transition into this state. This state, the transition had zero reward, but the value here is 0.25. That means the sample estimate is zero reward plus 0.25 future value. So the sample estimate of 0.25, half of that rounded is 0.13. So as we keep going through this, these values get closer and closer to the correct values. Now, let's see what happens if I go up here. And now I go down instead of sideways. What do you think is going to happen? Well, moving down, it's going to stay zero because there's no reward on the transition and there's no value yet in any of those actions in that state. So the sample value is zero, things just stay zero. What if I now go here? Still zero. Now exit here, I get something in here. Let's do this again. Now I go to the side, the negative values are propagating because the sample value was instantaneous reward plus the negative 0.5, and we average it with the zero we had before, and now this thing gets a negative value. Now, interesting things happening here. I keep going to the negative, and actually the values of all these states in the beginning keep going up. Like, look at the values here as I'm moving up. They keep increasing, even though I'm always experiencing pretty negative rewards. Why is that? It's because the way these values are computed is based on what the value is in the next state. And not what I have experienced particularly, but the best thing I have in that next state, which is actually based on going to the plus one. And even if I go now to the negative one, that does not affect these other values. In fact, going down from here still has zero value, even though I've always got the negative one. Why is that? Because I still have some zeros in that state. 
And in fact, I can even make going down positive. If I go down now, come back up, now I get a positive value for going up, now I exit, now I go again, I go down here, and now the value of that state on the top for going down has become positive because it knows that the best thing to do after that is come back up and then go right, and that's encoded in these Q values, and so it knows that there's positive value even in going down. It's better to go right than to go down, but it's also still positive value to go down. What if we follow the other path here? Um, well, we see here something positive. 0.37, why is that? Because from this current state, if we were to go up, we have high value, and that's propagated. Even though there's also a negative there, it doesn't take the negative, it takes the max of all those values, which is a 0.75, uses that in the sample estimate. And even if I go now, even if, oh, I did it for so long, it uh, exited, but you can go to the negative one for as long as you want, it'll still keep grabbing the most positive Q values to propagate. Let's look at another example, um, a more extreme kind of maze of this type. This is the bridge world, um, or cliff, well, bridge or cliff world. Essentially, um, the way it works is that the middle is safe and the ends have rewards, but if you go off to the side, you die with negative reward. So let's see what happens. We move um, to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right, and we get positive reward there. The Q value becomes positive. So at a plus 10, learning rate of a half becomes five. Let's go again, and now, when we transition from here, we expect a non-zero value because the sample will be zero reward plus a value of five. Half of that with learning rate of half will be 2.5 in there. Um, now, we can also jump off the cliff from here. Negative 50, not great. Uh, we can jump off the cliff here. Negative 50, not great. We can jump off the cliff here. Negative 50, not great. We can go jump off the cliff over here. Not great, but actually what happened is even though we ran this trajectory where we jump, jumped off the cliff, the value here went up. And now if I again go jump off a cliff, at this state the value will nevertheless go up because it knows that there is something good available and that's what the max Q value is and that's what's propagating. Yes? Okay. The question is, what happens if we jump off the cliff first? Let's just do it. So we need to reset this thing, of course, otherwise it's not first. Um, so let's do this again. Let's just jump off the cliff right away. And in fact, it's not that bad a decision per se, because it doesn't know how the world works. It's not like, oh, I'm going to jump off a cliff. It's more like, I've never been here. Let me go check it out. Oh, it turns out to be that I jumped off a cliff. That was not good. Um, that's the reinforcement learning world. And that's why typically reinforcement learning is more more easily experiment with in simulation than real world. Um, so let's jump off the middle cliff here. Boom, we jumped off. Okay, now we go again. What do we expect to happen? Well, as we go here, if we now move up again, it should know that that's a bad thing. And let's see if that happens. Yes, it knows. What if we're here again and now we actually move somewhere else? Let's say we move right. Um, it did not do anything. We move left, nothing. Nothing, nothing. No values get updated here. Why is that? Because if you look at the max value, it's still zero. So even if you're neighboring this negative 25, the max of that square is still zero, and so the max stays the same, and the negative 25 can't make it out. Um, even if we were to jump off this one, um, there's still some zeros available um, in that square. Um, let's see, what else can we... We, ca we cannot get negative values in there. Um, just because the zero is always better is the problem. Well, not the problem, it's a feature, it's a good thing. Uh, what it also showcases is the notion of off-policy learning. You're not learning the value of the policy that I'm executing. This thing is learning the value of the, uh, the optimal Q values, the values of the optimal policy, not my dumb policy that's just jumping off cliffs. No, it's learning, and now I'm maybe not so dumb so I can get some positive values every now and then. Um, and then these values are the ones that are going to propagate um, even if at some point I start jumping off the cliff again. So now we get these positive to come through. And now after they have kind of settled in place a bit, I can go through that again, but at the end try another cliff and still positive values will have propagated.
Now let's take a look at how well this works for our crawler bot. There'll be a video. So All right. what we're going to watch here is the crawler in action running Q-learning. That's what you're going to do in your project. So what are you seeing at the bottom left here? Bottom left is values. There is a two-dimensional state space. Really, the state space is continuous, but we discretized it. There's buckets. Like if you're between certain angles, you're in a certain state. Um, if you, you look at both angles, you fall into a bucket, and that's what's shown on the bottom left here. So based on your first angle, based on your second angle. We see the values are going up for if you're down here, so these are good states to be in. Here we have Q values, which is then compartmentalized. We have, um, in any state, we have four actions available for each Joint, we can either increase or decrease the value of the angle of that joint, and we do that for both, so two times two, four total actions. Um, and what we see here is that after it's been training for a while, it gets into a cycle where it goes through the same state over and over and over, which allows it to move fast to the right. Let's watch this one more time. So initially, these values are all initialized, um, uh, in this case, zero effectively, um, and it's exploring, but of course, we're accelerating the exploration a little bit in this demo where we are... Um, letting it run many, many steps uh, behind the scenes. Um, boom, one million steps, I believe. We just uh, let it learn. And values got a lot more precise after an extra one million steps. And you see it learns to locomote. The beauty here is that it doesn't know anything about how this world works. It just has been experiencing states, actions, and rewards, and figures out from that what are the optimal Q values to maximize reward. So this is actually a pretty amazing result. Q learning converges to the optimal policy, which is encoded in these optimal Q values, even if you're acting suboptimally. Just the way the propagation equations work, the suboptimal stuff doesn't propagate. Only the good stuff propagates somehow through that max, and this works out. That's important, because you don't know the optimal policy. If all you can do is learn the value of an existing policy, then it's very hard to find the value of the optimal policy because you don't know what the optimal policy is, chicken and egg problem. But with Q-learning, you can use any policy, as long as it visits every state sufficiently often, to learn the value of the optimal policy. This is called off-policy learning. Caveats. You need to explore enough. I said if you visit every state often enough, that's exploration. You need to go see all the states sufficiently often to understand what their values are. You have to make the learning rate decay over time. We'll see a scheme for that next lecture and also not decay too quickly, because otherwise your later experience cannot contribute enough to correct maybe some noisy past experience. But the beauty, again, is that in the limit, it does not matter how you select actions as long as you satisfy those properties. Okay, that's it for today. Next time, we'll look at these issues. See you on Thursday.